Welcome to this car seat. Uh, today we are speaking to Dr. Jeremy Bryce, LSE fellow in the Department of Sociology here at the LSE, who has spent two years uh, at CAR working um, with and at the Food Standards Agency here in the UK uh, on a diversity of projects. Uh, today we are speaking in particular about one project which was about information cultures uh, in food uh, regu safety regulation. Uh, Jeremy, so welcome. So what was this um, research about? Well, this project actually came about as part of a collaboration between CAR and the Food Standards Agency. And it happened because the FSA was embarking on a reform of the way that food regulation is delivered in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And this was, there were two planks to this. It was designed to make the delivery of food regulation more cost effective in a time of austerity and budget cuts, and also to make it more risk-based and targeted and proportionate to the behaviour of food businesses. And there were two planks to the reform. One was that there are two regulatory professions currently involved in delivering food regulations. Environmental health officers who do food hygiene inspections to make sure food is safe, and trading standards officers who do food standards inspections to check that food is what it says on the tin and nobody has been putting horse meat in the beef. And the FSA wanted these two professions to work more closely together to reduce duplication of inspections and burdens on food businesses, and also to see if it was possible to exempt more low-risk businesses from regular inspection, again, in order to reduce the regulatory burden. One of the ways that it wanted to go about this was to introduce a single national process for the registration and inspection of food businesses, gathering information about businesses in order to divide them into risk categories. But it was not entirely clear how um, food inspectors were gathering information about businesses currently or how that information was being used by other regulatory professions within local government. So I came in to do a piece of work looking at how environmental health officers and trading standards officers gather information about food businesses, how, whether they're sharing it with other regulatory professions and how it's used within the regulatory institutions of local government. And so what did you find about information cultures? Well, there were two really clear, clear findings. The first was that actually environmental health officers and trading standards officers had very different ways of producing information about businesses and about the risks that they might pose to the public. Um, they had different, what we might call, borrowing a term from Karen North Satina, epistemic cultures. They had different ways of producing knowledge. So environmental health officers tended to have what we might call an inspection-led culture. Um, most of the time they identified non-compliance through actually physically being present in food businesses which they were inspecting, engaging closely with business owners and observing um, shortcomings in practice. And they tended to have a really fine-grained local knowledge of food businesses within their jurisdiction. Um, but often this knowledge was quite tacit quite informal and quite difficult to share with people outside of their organisation. So they tended not to have that many regulatory information sharing partners. And possibly as a result of this, they had a distinctive approach to assessing risk, which was very focused on the professional judgment of the individual officer. Trading standards officers did things very differently. They had what we might call a intelligence-led regulatory culture, which tended to gather information more based on textual and numerical evidence that was submitted to them by a wide network of external partners and to have much more formal analytical processes for going through these pieces of, I guess, secondary information which others had provided to them and identifying trends and patterns which might indicate non-compliance. And as a result, they tended to have much more formal risk scoring and risk assessment processes which they use to determine whether to take enforcement action against a particular business and they were much less reliant on doing inspections. 
The second finding, actually, interestingly, was the extent to which environmental health officers, food hygiene inspections, were valued by other members of local authority staff. As other regulatory professions have become less field-based, they've become um, more focused on the intelligence-led approaches and they've started spending more time behind a desk, actually environmental health officers have become the regulatory profession who are most likely to be going out and engaging with businesses directly. So they actually have this very important role as the eyes and the ears of other regulatory functions. So funnily enough, although in a way they've been behind the curve in adopting more kind of intelligence-driven approaches to regulation, actually the, in, the value of their inspections to other professions has gone up over time as others have withdrawn from the field. That's fascinating. So different cultures of information gathering, professions, risk-based regulation um, and so on. So where would you say, can we sort of draw wider implications from your findings for the study of regulation and risk? Well, I guess there's two kind of big lessons for uh, scholars of regulation. And one is probably the importance of paying real attention to the professional cultures of different regulatory functions in trying to develop closer collaboration between um, different regulators. Because one of, one of the things that the FSA wanted to do was they wanted to get trading standards officers and environmental health officers to work more closely together and possibly to transfer some responsibilities for food standards regulation to the environmental health profession to reduce this duplication of inspections and duplication of regulation. And what I found was that in local councils which had tried to do this already, the intelligence-led approach of the trading standards profession didn't really transfer across to the environmental health officers. They found it quite alien. They weren't trained to use the database tools that training standards officers used. And um, often they reverted back more to an inspection-led approach. So I think there are kind of implications for practice there, which are probably worth coming on to. But it really um, shows the importance of attending to different epistemic cultures in looking at how different regulatory professions interact. Um, I think the other kind of important point here is to look at the relationship between risk-based approaches to regulation and regulatory responsiveness. Um, one of the things the FSA wanted to do was to take, to, was to find ways to exempt low-risk businesses from regular um, food hygiene inspections. But actually that would have removed those businesses to a large extent from one of the main forms of regulatory supervision. So there was a risk that in taking away um, regular inspections, particularly if you were transferring responsibility for food regulation to a more inspection driven profession, food businesses would actually be subject to much less regular oversight. And there was a danger that businesses which were low risk at the point when they were exempted would end up changing ownership or changing their activities and being higher, becoming higher risk and regulators would end up unaware of this. So I think there's been an understanding in the literature that risk-based appro approaches and, regula and responsive regulation are different, but they're probably compatible. You can have sort of really responsive risk-based regulation. And actually, this suggests that taking a risk-based approach may actually be in tension with regulatory responsiveness in some cases. And for the FSA, you mentioned they are in a process of reform and looking at things. Uh, what, are, what can they take away from your findings? I think the number one kind of urgent point is that if they're looking for ways to um, exempt a larger proportion of businesses from regular inspection, then actually it's probably quite important that that exemption is time limited. 
so that if a business is removed from inspection, then perhaps they skip one or two rounds of inspection, but there is a defined process for bringing that business back into the inspection programme and back into more regular regulatory oversight in order to check whether it's changed its behaviour, whether its compliance status has changed, and to balance that risk-based approach with regulatory responsiveness. I think the second lesson is that in encouraging closer working between trade, the trading standards profession and environmental health officers, it's important not simply to transfer responsibilities, but to foster ways of co-working which play to the strength of each profession. So for instance, we might look at greater sharing of intelligence databases between trading standards and environmental health officers, um, both so that environmental health officers have access to the quite sophisticated intelligence resources that exist within the trading standards profession, rather than trying to sort of reinvent the wheel by themselves. And also to see if some of the local knowledge and the kind of direct observation of business behaviour which is available to environmental health officers can be fed back to trading standards as well. And what would, should the FSA do then? Uh, I mean, you mentioned a few priorities right now, but um, what do you think are sort of the key things they should put on the agenda straight away? I think, um, again, the first thing to put on the agenda is to ensure that there's a formal and a time-limited process for bringing businesses which are exempted back into inspection programmes. The second is to look at greater sharing of intelligence databases between environmental health officers and trading standards officers. And the third is probably to look at creating a broader base of shared skills and information gathering competencies between the two professions so that they speak each other's languages to a slightly greater degree. Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.